जीएसटी की मास्टर क्लास टुडे इज द सेकेंड जीएसटी मास्टर क्लास इन इंग्लिश एंड द फिफ्थ इन द सीरीज ऑफ मास्टर क्लासेस दैट हैव बीन हेल्ड सो फार अ सब्जेक्ट टुडे विल बी ऑफ पर्टिकुलर इंटरेस्ट टू ट्रेडर्स मैन्युफैक्चरर्स टैक्स प्रैक्टिशनर्स चार्टर्ड अकाउंटेंट्स एज वेल एज जर्नलिस्ट एज ऑलवेज एंड अ सब्जेक्ट टुडे इज ट्रांजिशन एंड इनवॉइस मेकिंग We are live on Doordarshan network, and you can also watch us live on various social media handles of PIB India. That is on YouTube as well as on Facebook. You can also watch this live webcast on PIB's website, which is pib.nic.in. On this subject, uh, transition and invoice making, we have received a lot of uh, questions on social media, and the most frequently asked uh, questions have been uh, slotted for uh, today's uh, session on the basis of relevance. Answering them will be Senior Finance Ministry official. officials we also have representation from the government of uh, karnataka as well and uh, let me introduce them to you we are joined by hasmuk adya revenue secretary opendra gupta gst policy commissioner cbec and i'm also pleased to introduce uh, ritwik pande commissioner commercial taxes government of karnataka so i'll tell you a little about uh, the format of uh, today's session there will be opening remarks uh, by the revenue secretary followed by presentation uh, by uh, upendra gupta and that will be followed by the foqs uh, being answered by the officials present here and after that we'll open the floor for questions so let's begin with opening remarks by the revenue secretary thank you very much today the second class on gst uh the subject today is transition and invoice uh, related rules the people are now transiting from the old system of vat excise duty and service tax into the gst regime and there is a lot of stock which is available with people on 30th of june so the questions arise in the mind of people as to how they are going to avail of the input tax credit on the goods which are held in stock as on 1st of july so the transition rules refer to this particular matter so today in our presentation we would be explaining under what circumstances and to what kind of people this kind of a input tax credit is available so we will talk in detail about it the second subject is about the invoice now lot of people have got doubts about what kind of an invoice book should i make what kind of detail should the invoice contain and who all are supposed to maintain the invoice uh, book etc so all these questions will be answered in the presentation relating to invoice so today i am glad to uh, say that uh, apart from the cell government team which has been taking the master class today we also have the presence of uh, mr ritwik pande who is the Uh, in fact now he has just been switched to the secretary budget in the department of finance in the government of karnataka so he is also here today he had come for one of our low committee meetings so i requested him he will also be here to answer your questions so we start with the presentation i'll request my colleague upender to kindly make a presentation thank you sir uh, like revenue secretary has mentioned today's topic are twofold one is transition and second in invoice so in transition because uh, we'll not talk about the migration of tax payers which has been covered yesterday so primarily i'll focus on the on the transition of input tax credit which is available today and how and under what circumstances it will be transferred to the new registration which would be there in in gst regime so the presentation the format tip of the presentation is like this that what are the situations and how the tax credits would be transited the first situation is that i am registered today in the central excise or vat or service tax how do i get itc on 1st of july so if you are already registered you will file the return for the month of june uh, 2017 or maybe for the quarter 2017 and there would be some closing balance in the return of related to sanvet credit in case of central government and itc as it is called in case of state governments so the entire closing balance which is reflected in the return as on 30th june 2017 that will be transferred as the cgst credit the credit relating to central excise and service tax and the credit relating to vat would be transited as sgst credit the conditions for that is you must have filed your return last six returns that is for the period from january to 
June 2017, you should have submitted your return. You should be registered as a normal taxpayer in GST regime. So if you take a registration as a composition taxpayer, then obviously you are not entitled for input tax credit and therefore the closing balance which is reflected in the return uh, of, as on 30th June will not be transited. The other condition is that the credit should be admissible as input tax credit. There may be some credits which were available in the pre-GST regime, but on certain items it may not be allowed in GST regime. In such a situation, to that extent, although there would be closing balance, but the credit will not transit. To avail the credit, you have to just submit a declaration in Table 5 of GST Trans 1, the, which is part of the uh, part of the uh, CGST rules and the SGST rules notified with effect from 1st of July and that uh, de uh, that de declaration can be filed by 30th September. Within three months it is to be filed. Uh, the commissioner has power to extend this for further three months and it can be filed any number of times because there is a, there may, sit may arise some situation where the return is uh, revised. In such a situation, the trans 1, uh, the table 5 of trans 1, the information contained therein is also to be revised. One important thing, the point which I was making is the credit should be admissible as ITC in GST. The uh, example would be the CESIS. The credit of CES is allowed today in central excise and service tax, Krishi Kalyan says, or the Swachh Bharat says, but it is not there in the GST regime. So that credit may be reflected in the return but will not be migrated, uh, will not be transited. The second situation is with respect to capital goods. The capital goods, as you are aware, the credit is admissible in two installments. In most of the states also, it is similar situation. So therefore, the return would carry, for, carry forward the balance only to the extent of 50%. The remaining 50%, which is not reflected in the return, the law and the rules provide that the remaining amount would be transited to the GST regime as CGST or SGST credit and the information is required to be filed in table 6 of GST trans 1 again up to 30th September and there the details of every item of capital goods will be transferred. Again, I am making very clear that no permission is required for this transition. It is just a submission of information in the form of a declaration. The credit would be automatically you will be eligible to take in your <coughs> electronic credit ledger. The next situation would be the if I am unregistered today, but I become a register in GST regime, then what happens? So if I am unregistered, I do not get any input tax credit today, but if I get registered in GST regime, then I would be eligible for input tax credit. The law and the rules provide that you will be eligible for the credits in respect of inputs held in stock and the inputs contained in semi-finished or finished goods held in stock as on 30th June. And to that, the, if you have duty paying document, then only you will get the credit. There are certain conditions which I will take in the uh, uh, two, three slides later because the conditions for the three situations which I am talking are same. So in this situation, you will get the credit of duty paid on inputs which are lying as such or the inputs which are contained in the semi-finished or finished goods, you will be entitled for taking the credit. The next situation is that I am registered as composition taxpayer in the GST, in the current regime, and I am getting registered as a normal taxpayer in GST regime. In that situation also, because you are not entitled for credit today, but in GST regime you will be entitled for credit, so therefore same condition that you will be eligible for input tax credit in respect of tax paid on input held in stock and the inputs contained in semi-finished or finished goods held in stock as on 30th June. The next situation is that I was exempt today or I was ex I was dealing in exempted and dutiable goods both. So can I take the credit when my entire uh, goods in which I deal will be, uh, will, will be taxable in GST regime. So in this situation also the same principle will apply. The credits which is there in respect of dutiable goods, you, will, you would have filed the return and you will get the credit. And that situation is the number one situation which we had talked earlier. 
in respect of goods which were which were exempt and which are now becoming taxable and therefore you will be liable to pay gst after uh, when you make clearances or when you supply after 1st of july the same principle will apply that you will get the input tax credit in respect of inputs held in stock as such and the inputs contained in semi finished goods so these three situations i was not registered i was registered as composition taxpayer i was dealing both in dutiable and exempted goods and the uh, adjust uh, a like situation is that i was registered as a first stage dealer or i was registered as a second stage dealer in a concept which is known in central excise or i was registered as importer or i was registered as a depot of a manufacturer or i was availing i was supplying works contract services but i was availing the benefit of notification number 26 of 2012 Uh, under under service tax so in all these situations all these situations together you will get the credits of inputs and in held in stock and inputs contained in semi finished or finished goods the important thing which is to be noted is that you will not get the credit of input services nor you will get credit of capital goods now the conditions in under which the the credits would be admissible are like this next slide please that the inputs or goods which are lying with you on which you intend to take the credit should be used for making taxable supplies in gst that is one uh, that is one condition which is to be satisfied then all those goods or uh, all those inputs or uh, goods which are uh, on which you want to take the credit they should be entitled they should be eligible for availing the input tax credit under the gst regime if some of the goods are not entitled then you will not get the credit the third condition is that you must possess the duty paying documents ev evidencing that the duty has been paid on that the fourth condition is that the invoice should not be one more than one year old so therefore if the invoice is older to 30th june 2016 you will not be entitled to the credit the fourth situation is that you have to just submit a declaration in table 7 of trans 1 up to 30th september or it can be revised so all these conditions have to be satisfied and you will get the credit in respect of inputs as such or inputs contained in semi finished or finished goods coming to the next situation that i am a trader and therefore i was not registered under central excise or service tax but i was registered under vat so what happens obviously i do not have the duty paying documents evidencing the payment of central excise duty so what happens in that situation because now i will be liable to pay cgst also on my supplies made after 1st of july but the cost the central excise duty is part and parcel of the value of goods which is lying with me so in that situation the credits how whether the credit would be admissible the answer is yes you will get the credit if you have duty paying documents evidencing the central excise duty payment you will get full credit but if you don't have duty paying documents in that situation what happens the the rules section rule 117 provides that you will get deemed credit at the rate of 60% or 40% as the case may be the 60% credit would be admissible if the rate of tax on the goods which you will supply is 18 or 28% and if the rate of tax is 5 or 12 when i say 5 or 12 it is combined rate 2.5% cgst 2.5 sgst so if the combined rate is 5 or 12 then you get 60 uh, 40% credit so and the credit would be given when you make the supply so for example if the supply is made in the month of august let us say and then the august return would be filed on 20th september on 20th september you will pay cgst of 2.5% so 40% of 2.5% would be credited to your electronic credit ledger on 20th september this is how the scheme would would be operated the scheme is there for a period of 6 months so all this stock must be cleared before uh, the end of the calendar year that is 31st december and you will get deem credit the condition is that you must you must have the documents of procurement of goods because even if you were dealer you were entitled for vat credit and therefore the vat document must be available with you to show that you have procured the 
goods. The next condition is that the goods should not have been unconditionally exempt. The meaning of this is that, for example, if you are buying the goods from SSI unit today, or if you are buying, the, if you have bought these goods from a unit located in, let us say, Baddi or Uttaranchal, where the area-based schemes are operating. So even then, even though no duty was paid, but if you are buying goods from such entities, because these goods were not unconditionally exempt, you will be entitled for this deemed credit scheme. The condition is that the, the ITC which is allowed to you should not, should the benefit thereof should be passed on to the consumer. You, you will get this credit, 40% or 60%, but you will charge the tax. Now you can't charge full tax from the customer and yet avail the input tax credit. So that care has to be taken. For this, a declaration in tra form TRAN 2 is to be submitted at the end of every month. It is unlike TRAN 1, which, is to, which was to be filed by 30th September. This is to be filed by every uh, end of every month. And as I said, this scheme is for six months. One other scheme which we have introduced by amending the Sandbed credit rules. We have issued a notification, and uh, notification number being 21 of 2017. It is a central excise non-tariff notification. It was issued and it has brought in a concept of what is called credit transfer document, CTD. It is specifically meant for the traders because they do not have any duty paying documents and we are able to provide the benefit of deemed credit. So for certain high value items and the scheme is like this. The CTD provides that the, if the value of the individual item is more than 25,000 rupees per piece, if they are identifiable by a distinct number, and if we have verifiable records of clearances and the duty payment related to each piece, then the trader, the one who is having the stock of such items, can request the manufacturer of such item, of those items to issue a credit transfer document within a period of 45 days. That means from 1st July to 15th August, this request can be made by the trader to the manufacturer and he would issue a CTD and he will declare this information in trans 3. And in if you have got this document, then you will get full credit of the duty paid by the manufacturer. So no deemed business. The only limitation which has been put is that in respect of entire stock available with you, either you will avail the, this, trans, uh, this CTD procedure or you will follow the deemed credit procedure. You can't have mix and match. So either you follow this and you get full credit because you don't have duty paying document. This is a fresh document, the scheme for which has been declared on 30th June by, by this notification number 21 of 17 under central excise, non-tariff notification. So the trader also gets full credit if he has duty paying documents. If he doesn't have duty paying documents, if he has CTD, then he gets full. Otherwise, he gets deemed credit. The next situation is that I was registered under VAT. So do I get the credit of CST, the central sales tax? Today also the central, uh, central sales tax credit is not admissible. So therefore, the law and rules provide that you will not get the CST credits. But <coughs> If the now uh, today uh, well, the against the C form, F form, etc., the ITC will not be allowed to be carried forward. But when you submit the C form, the surplus credit on account of interstate sale or on account of export sale, the surplus credit which is lying with the bad dealer will not be allowed to be carried forward. But on submission of these forms, the refund would be permitted after the forms are submitted. The next situation is that I am an input service distributor registered today, but I was not able to distribute the input tax credit because I have received the invoices on which I have to uh, distribute the credit after 1st July. So the law and rules provides that the input service distributor will obtain a fresh registration under GST regime, but they would be allowed to distribute the credit in respect of services which were received prior to 1st July, but the invoices of which has been received on or after 1st July. So there would not be any uh, denial of credit because the invoices were not available before 30th June. The next 
the next situation is that in service tax as you are aware today we have a provision of centralized registration in gst we will the service provider have to have state wise registration so <clears throat> they will be migrated from a centralized registration to state wise registration but today the credits is they are only in one place if somebody some unit is some service provider is registered let us say in maharashtra and now they are obtaining registration in five states because they are providing services from five other states also then the credit would get transferred under first situation because this person would be filing the return and the closing balance of the return would be transferred to the registration in maharashtra so can he distribute this credit to other five registrations that was the issue because the earlier he was paying tax from one place and he was taking credit also in one place but now he will make supplies from five places and he will also require the <coughs> the credits transfers from five places and which because he will use that credit for payment of service tax after he makes the supplies uh, of payment of gst after he makes the supplies so the law and rules provide <coughs> that you will be eligible to transfer the credits as you want so you can transfer the credits which is there in maharashtra to all five states in whatever ratio you want the only requirement is that you will submit this information in table 8 of form 101 the next situation is which agitates the mind of the people is that my appeal is pending my revisionary proceedings are pending my refunds are pending in pre gst regime relating to sandvet or relating to any demand what happens to those situations what happens when i get some relief in appeal or revision proceedings so the the law and rules provides that you will be eligible to get the refund if you get favorable order in appeal on revision procedures or your refund application get decided after after 1st july the relaxation which has been provided in the law and rules is that today you do not get refund in cash but in gst regime you will get the uh, refund in cash because uh, otherwise if we transfer then it would have wasted so we will allow you the refunds in cash although the principle of unjust enrichment which is applicable even today and which has been provided in gst regime also that principle would be applied as far as recovery is concerned if some demand has arisen for pre gst period or some appeal has gone against the taxpayer in pre uh, or, uh, in post gst period then the law provides that the recovery would be made first under the existing law under the uh, uh, this uh, savings provisions repeal and saving provisions and if we are not able to recover in the pre gst under the existing law then the recovery would happen and as per the provisions of the gst law the next situation is that i have entered into a contract before 1st july but supply has been received or made after 1st july what happens which tax is to be charged so the law provides that in such situation because it has happened the service the supply has happened afterwards or supply has, in such a situation gst would be liable although the service was uh, although the contract is was entered into before 1st july so this completes first part of the <coughs> presentation relating to transitional provisions now i will move to the tax invoice provisions so the tax invoice provisions the first slide is who can raise invoice the tax invoice can be raised only by a registered person and he can issue the uh, issue the invoice in two situations if he is making a supply of taxable goods or services then he must issue a taxable invoice or if he is receiving taxable goods or services from a unregistered person then also he must be uh, issuing the tax invoice there are some exceptions as far as first situation is concerned where he is supplying the goods taxable goods or services the law and rules provides that if the value of supply is up to 200 rupees in such a situ and the supply is to a consumer so meaning thereby it is not a b2b supply the recipient doesn't insist for issuance of invoice in such a situation the registered person may not issue the invoice if the value is up to 200 rupees subject to the condition that he will issue a consolidated invoice at the end of the day 
so this will uh, this will uh, help the smaller taxpayers selling supplying small in smaller value goods or services so in such situation only a consolidated invoice will be issued as far as the reverse charge situations are concerned a registered person receiving taxable goods or services from a registered person meaning where section 9 subsection 3 is applicable in such a situation the registered person is not required to issue any invoice but if he is receiving goods or services from a unregistered person that is where the section 94 is applicable in such situation at the time of receipt of goods or services the registered person is required to issue a invoice but here also we have provided some exception to provide relief to the large number of taxpayers what has been provided is that if you receive goods or services from a unregistered person of a value up to 5000 rupees per day from one or more suppliers from one or more suppliers if the value is up to 5000 rupees we have given exemption from applicability of 94 no gst to be paid and therefore no invoice is to be raised but if the value some day is more than 5000 rupees then at the end of day at, at the end of the month you will consolidate all such, such purchases in one invoice and at the last day of the month you will invoice you will issue one invoice to record all such sub, uh, receipts value of which is more than this amount which i have just mentioned where the reverse charge gst is to be paid on reverse charge basis now what are the important contents of tax invoice the important uh, contents are that the GST of the supplier should be there, the consecutive serial number should be there, the date of issue of invoice should be there. If the recipient is registered, his GST should be mentioned. If he is not registered, then the name and address of the recipient should be there. HSN code should be there. HSN code, which digits? I will just come to that point a little later. Description of goods or services should be there. In case of goods, the, uh, the uh, quantity should be mentioned. The total value of the supply should be mentioned, then the, to the taxable value of the supply should be mentioned in the invoice, the tax rate, what is the central tax rate, what is the state tax rate, what is the integrated tax rate and what is the CES. As you are aware, the tax is either central tax plus state tax or central tax plus union territory tax or integrated tax. So these are mutually exclusive. So the tax rate should be mentioned, the amount of tax charge of central tax and state tax or union territory tax as the case may be has to be there. The place of supply has to be mentioned. The address of delivery, if it is different than the place of supply, it should be mentioned. If the tax is payable on reverse charge basis, it should be mentioned, meaning thereby the, for the, the contents on the invoice, whether you are receiving as supplier or whether you are <coughs> issuing the invoice as recipient are same. The only difference is this information that tax is to be payable on reverse charge basis and the signature of authorized signature should be there there is a lot of uh, uh, misgivings about this that the invoice has to be digitally signed i am making it clear that the there is no requirement of any dig digital signatures on the invoice it can be issued uh, by manual signatures also another misgiving that i must issue the invoice only electronically that is also not clear the invoice can be issued manually also once the gstr1 procedure etc would come not all the details are required to be uploaded only few specified details would be required to be uploaded then and that can be done from a manual invoice also no electronic invoice is required another uh, message which is uh, going around in social media is that if you are buying from big shopping malls etc then you get the invoice split in various values so if you get the invoice up to 1000 the tax rate is zero if it is up to 1500 it is 2.5 percent and so on it is only a rumor there is no such provision in the law whatever value of goods or services you procure the tax rates are only four 5%, 12%, 18%, 28%, in some cases SES is there and in jewellery there is some other rate. So it is all rumour, we should not go by this rumours. The important thing is that the same rules, the same contents are applicable in case of bill of supply also, in case of debit note also and in case of credit note also, wherever it is required. 
so invoice would look like something like this the the portion which have been rounded these are the important things which i have just mentioned the next issue is that at what level the hsn codes are to be mentioned we have issued notification number 12 of 2017 and it clearly says that if you are aggregate turnover in the preceding financial year was up to 1.5 crores no hsn code is required if the turnover is between 1.5 crores to 5 crores the two digit hsn code is to be given and if it is more than 5 crores it is four digit Trader should not worry on this account because they are procuring the goods either from manufacturer or the importer, and on both these documents, the HSN codes are already there. How to raise an invoice? In case of supply of goods, the invoice is to be raised in triplicate. Original is meant for the recipient, the buyer. The duplicate is to be given to the transporter, and the triplicate copy is for the supplier. In case of services, it is to be issued in duplicate. Origin original is for recipient, and duplicate is for the supplier. the only requirement in the return rule is uh, that uh, the serial number of the invoice issued during the month from this invoice to this invoice is to be mentioned in gstr1 <coughs> which as you are aware the procedure has been suspended for two months how to raise an invoice when to raise an invoice so if you are supplying goods so if the goods involve movement of goods the invoice is to be issued at the time of removal of goods if the it the supply doesn't involve movement of goods then when you are making delivery to your customer at that time invoices to be issued if the goods have been sold uh, supplied on sale or return basis in that case you will issue the invoice either when the supply materializes that means the consumer confirms that i have bought the goods or 6 months from the date of removal whichever is earlier in case of services the invoice is to be issued like presently the provisions which are there in service tax law that the invoice will be issued within 30 days of the supply of services and in case of certain sectors like insurance and banking it would be issued in 45 days there are certain special cases which have been provided so bill of supply when bill of supply can be issued if you are supplying exempted goods a bill of supply is to be issued and not a tax invoice if you are under composition levy again you can't issue a tax invoice you will issue a bill of supply there is a provision of revised invoice the revised invoice will be issued against a bill of supply and this will be issued in those cases where the bill of supply was issued between the period from the effective date of registration till the issuance of registration for example for applying registration you have 30 days to apply so you have applied for registration on 1st july you have got registration let us say on 10th but it is effective from 1st of july so during this 10 days you must have supplied the goods you would have issued bill of supply because you can't issue tax invoice so for these 10 days whatever clearance has been made you will issue a revised invoice which will be a tax invoice the receipt voucher is to be issued if you are receiving advance payments and the refund voucher is to be issued in cases the advance payment was received but no supply could be made and the advance was received uh, was returned in that case the refund voucher will be issued certain more special cases are isd invoice input service distributor has to issue a isd invoice so particulars which are there in the invoice are mentioned specifically the other documents in case of insurance in case of banking company in case of transporter in case of airlines they generally don't issue invoice today also they don't issue invoice so for example in insurance company the policy itself will be treated as invoice in case of a banking company the bank statement itself will be treated as invoice in case of airlines the air ticket itself would be treated as invoice and in case of transporter the consignment note will be treated as invoice so they will not be required to issue invoices another thing which i must mention is that there is no format of invoice only the particulars which should be contained in invoice should be there and not no format has been prescribed then in certain cases you because you can't issue invoices a delivery chalan is to be issued and once the supply gets confirmed the invoice will be issued they are generally the delivery chalan is generally issued in case of liquid gases in case of job work in case of uh in case of skd and ckd supplies in case of export invoice the invoice format in the particulars of invoice are similar what is there in case of normal supplies but it must contain a endorsement that the supply is meant for export on payment of integrated tax or under bond or letter of undertaking without payment of igst then credit notes when can be credit notes be issued 
the tax invoice has already been raised, the credit note will be required to be issued when you find that the taxable value or the tax charge in the tax invoice was more than what should I should have charged or when the goods are returned or when the goods or services which I have supplied are deficient in nature. In all such situations, the credit note can be issued by the supplier to the recipient. The important thing to note is that he can issue a credit note any time. But to reduce his liability, because the credit note will have the effect of reduction in the output liability of the supplier, in <coughs> that would be allowed only if two conditions are satisfied. Namely, the credit note has been issued up to September of the next year. For example, we are in 17-18, so before September 18, the credit note must be issued. And the second condition is September 18 or annual return, whichever is earlier. Annual return date is up to 31st December. So generally up to before 30th September, it should be there. And the second condition is that the recipient should reduce his input tax credit, which he has availed on the tax invoice. And the last is issue is debit note. The debit note is issued when the taxable value or the tax charge is found to be less than what should have been charged. In that a case, debit note can be issued and there is no such restriction in case of debit note. So <coughs> all these documents are available on our website. The URL is mentioned. Uh, just, just one second. The URLs are mentioned. Uh, uh, like this, cbc.gov.in, cbc-gst.gov.in, all these materials are available on our website. You can go through and there are a number of other material also available on this website. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Gupta, for uh, the presentation. Let's take the most frequently asked questions on the subject of transition first. The first question is, I am a registered person under existing laws. How do I register in GST? This was answered yesterday, so we'll skip it. Second question, I was registered and providing unconditionally exempted, example, uh, textiles uh, supplies under existing laws. Will I get ITC if I register in GST? Uh, see, uh, uh, with respect to uh, unconditionally exempt uh, commodities are concerned because no tax has been paid on that commodity itself. Uh, there is no credit available. So there is, therefore, there is uh, no ITC available uh, in, during in the transition also. I was registered and providing supplies under existing laws, but was availing SSI exemption. Will I get ITC if I register in GST? That also, I think, has been answered. That if you are an SSI exemption, then you were not registered. Okay. I was registered and providing job work services under existing laws. Will I get ITC if I register normally in GST? Here also, he will be registered uh, as, a, uh, as a service provider under GST. And suppose I have certain uh, inputs lying. Say, for example, if I'm, if I'm doing paint job work, then I have certain inputs in form of paints. And therefore, I'll get the credit of, uh, uh, of the tax paid on, the, on those, those goods. Uh, there are conditions, as Upinder just pointed out, that it should not have been purchased before one year from the transition date and all. I was registered and my inputs were sent for job work before 1st July 2017 but not returned. What will be the treatment in GST? In this situation, uh, the uh, law provides that uh, if the goods are returned within six months, then no GST would be payable. But if the goods are not returned by the job worker to the principal in such a situation, the input tax credit which was availed by the principal because he has not reversed the credit while sending the goods to the job worker. That will have to be reversed by the principal. The other condition is that both the principal and the job worker should have declared on 1st July that these are the principal would declare that this is the quantity lying with the job worker and job worker would decide that this is the quantity in respect of the one or more principals was lying with it. That declaration submitted, then these conditions would be set in. I sold goods and invoices were raised with TDS requirement in existing laws. I received payment after 1st July. Will there be TDS under GST? In TDS, uh, because the invoice has been raised before 1st July, the tax is payable under the, uh, under the earlier regime. Because the tax is payable under the earlier regime, the TDS also has to be done under the earlier regime if it is applicable. Under GST, there is no TDS requirement because the time of supply happened before the transition date. 
My goods or capital goods are lying with my agent on 1st July. Will I get input tax credit carry forward? Here, see if the goods are lying with the agent uh, and it is, it is a purchase by me, so it was my input tax credit. But now, if the agent, after the transition date, because if he supplies the goods, the liability will come on him. So the law says that this uh, uh, credit should be reduced by the principal and the credit should be taken by the agent. So the, it, it, I'll not be eligible for ITC, the agent will be eligible for ITC. I paid service tax in advance for work contract services, but actual supply completed after 1st July. What will be the treatment under GST? So in this case, as per the present service tax law, the tax is payable on at receipt of advance. So when I have received the advance before 1st July, I would have paid the service tax. So to that extent, I will not be required to pay GST, meaning thereby if the, con if the contract, let us say, was for 10 lakhs, I had received 5 lakh rupees as advance, so I would have paid service tax on 5 lakh rupees. Now remaining 5 lakhs, I will issue the invoice for entire 10 lakhs, but the point of taxation, the time of supply will arise in GST regime only to the extent of 5 lakhs. So on 5 lakhs, I will pay GST and I will not pay any GST because I have already paid service tax on 5 lakhs before 30th June. I received inputs or input services after 1st July, but tax was paid under the existing law. Will I be eligible to avail input tax credit? You will be eligible. You will be eligible. My old contracts got revised and prices have changed. What will be the treatment under GST? Where there is a price revision, uh, uh, whether upward or downward, the new credit or debit note will be issued under the GST regime. So therefore, all revisions will be treated as if they are supplied in uh, the GST regime. Let's take our frequently asked questions on invoice making. I have not yet uh, received my GSTN. Can I issue invoices without uh, GSTIN? Uh, this was answered yesterday. So we can move on to the second question. Is there any set pro forma for invoice? Uh, can it be issued in any form? Word by me in my presentation that only the contents of the invoice have been mentioned in the rules. No performer has been prescribed. So the taxpayers are free to have any performer which they want as long as the prescribed contents are contained in the invoice. Am I required to issue a tax notice or bill of supply in all cases? The if this, this also was covered by Pantasani's presentation that where the value of supply is less than 200 rupees and the recipient is not insisting uh, on an issue of invoice in a B2C uh, supply, there is no need to issue a supply for a bill of uh, or bill of supply or invoice for every supply. It can be done on a consolidated basis at the end of the day. I am a retailer and I supply both taxable and uh, exempt products uh, to the same person, B2C. Am I required to issue tax invoice and bill of supply separately? No, here also uh, I can issue one invoice. In the same invoice, I can show taxable as well as exempt supply separately. Will my invoice uh, having many different products at different tax rates be considered as a mixed supply? It will not be a mixed supply as long as I am showing the value of individual item differently. So if I am selling three products, attracting 5, 12 or 18 percent, so as long as I charge different price, for all three items, it will not be mixed supply. So I will, on my invoice, I will show three different line items and show the different tax rates and the different tax amount and accordingly I will charge the tax. Are all expenses like freight, insurance, etc. to be shown separately in the invoice? It will depend on how the, uh, the contract has been designed. If it is uh, designed to be charged separately, then it will be shown separately in the invoice. Otherwise, it pump all part of the one supply itself. Should I make an invoice to self for reverse charge payments? This point was covered in the presentation that if you are receiving supplies which are subject to reverse charge under 9.3 because the goods or services are there on which the tax is to be paid by the recipient, in that case invoice is not to be issued. But if you are receiving supplies which are uh, from an unregistered person under 9.4, then you will be required to issue self-invoice. That too, only in those cases where what I had explained that if it, the value was less, more than 5,000 rupees per day from one or more persons and only a monthly invoice is to be issued. How do I issue invoice in case of receipt of supplies liable for reverse charge? 
covered. As, as sir pointed out that if for all supplies reverse charge which are above 5000 rupees one consolidated invoice can be issued at the end of the month because I am paying tax and I am taking credit on that invoice. So one consolidated invoice is enough. If invoice is raised in June and supply was completed in July, will GST apply? Also because invoice has been raised in June itself, so the liability has arisen under the earlier, under the earlier tax regime itself. So even though the uh, supply is being completed in July, the time of supply or the time of sale or the time of provision of service has happened already in the earlier regime. How will credit or debit note from unregistered supplier be reported to GSTN and input tax credit claimed for the same? Here also it is like invoice only. So like invoice I am doing a self invoicing, I will be doing a self credit note and debit note. Can we move construction material to builders on delivery chalan and issue tax invoice post completion of the activity? Delivery chalan is made for uh, goods where uh, supply is either there is no supply or where there is supply is there but certain particulars of supply are not known. So in such cases where suppose machinery is being used, is being moved, so delivery chalan will be there. But where construction material is being moved and it is being invoiced, there specific invoice should be issued. Can I issue manual invoices? That has been answered in the presentation. That, that you can issue manual invoices. Let's move on. Uh, can I continue the serial number of invoices uh, which I have issued under the existing laws? This is the choice of the taxpayer from what serial number they want to issue. If they want to continue the same serial number, they are, um, <coughs> they can do it. The only requirement is that the invoice post 1st July must contain the particular which are prescribed in the rules. Some more questions have come on social media. Rajesh Savant has asked with the hashtag Ask Adia, in purchase invoice CGST is 14%, SGST is 14%, CES is 5%, levy is 4170 per 1000 stick charged. How do I make a bill to the consumer? In this case, the invoice must indicate the uh, amount of tax rate and the tax amount separately. So first you will show the value of supplies, then you will show the CGST rate and the amount, SGST rate and the amount and the CES and the total will include the value and all uh, CGST, SGST as well as CES. Prabhish Kumar uh, has asked a question, is it mandatory to print PAN number of stock receiving dealer on tax invoice? Uh, the, in, the, in the GST invoice, you have to mention the GSTIN of the recipient. So, if suppose the stock transfer is, uh, is uh, the recipient of the stock transfer is, uh, if it is interstate, then it is in the course of, it is a supply and therefore the GSTIN of the recipient will be mentioned, not the PAN actually. Kamlesh Changrani has asked, enlighten on procedure for a trader for taking input tax credit on SENVAT credit for stocks held on 30th June. So this was elaborately covered in the presentation. Just for the sake of clarity, I will again repeat. If the trader has the duty paying documents, he will get full credit. But if the trader, and when I say duty paying documents, including the credit transfer document which has been prescribed under central excise on 30th June. If the trader doesn't have any duty paying documents, then he will be eligible to avail 40% or 60% as deemed credit. 40% in those cases where the tax rate is 5 or 12% and 60% where the rate is 18 or 28%. The credit would be allowed in the month in which the CA supply was made and when the output CGST has been paid. So you pay the CGST and you take this much credit in your electronic credit ledger in that month. And this is scheme is there for six months. So all this pre-budget, pre-GST regime stock must be cleared by 31st of December. One last question. Is it mandatory for composition uh, trader to provide bill to customer? This has been reiterated many times by the secretary himself. The answer to this is no, it is not mandatory. So let's uh, open the floor to questions now. Uh, If you have any questions, please raise your hands. So, uh, in an e-commerce platform, the sale happened before the GST rolled out, but goods were returned, they came back after the GST was rolled out. What would be the treat 
these goods. So when, uh, uh, just I would like to inform you that TCS provisions have not yet been notified and they'll be notified sometime later. Uh, uh, and when they're notified, and then my, suppose this thing happens, because the law says that it is on the net uh, value of taxable supplies. So net means what is the outward supplies minus what are the credit notes issued. So even if that good was supplied before GST, doesn't matter because the return is happening uh, during the GST regime. It will form part of the negative part of the net supplies. Any other question? Sir, suppose say for a merchant exporter who, who is a register in a bed, not in a central excise, he has a, some stock which were purchased before 30th June. Now he wants to export, but as per the export invoices, how do he take care of it? Export invoice, as I had mentioned like, in the present. No, that is an integrated tax paid or LUT and all that condition, sir. But that he has a, some stocks where Senbet has already been paid. Because he is already registered in VAT, yes, sir. he will have credits of VAT, he will file return under VAT, that would be transferred as SGST credit. Now when he exports, so he will either pay on payment of IGST or he will do exports on bond. So as far as invoicing is concerned, invoice is similar, which is there in case of domestic supplies, except that the he has to uh, give a uh, mention on the invoice that it is for export purposes. Same thing he can take, take the credit if he doesn't have the uh, duty paying documents for excise. So that credit he can either uh, use for payment of IGST or if he is exporting under bond he can take refund of that credit after submission as per the refund rules which has been laid down in rule 96 and rule 96A. Is there any other question? If uh, uh, turnover is less than 20 lakh rupees, so there is a no need to register with the GST. If I purchase uh, from uh, unregistered dealer, whether RCM is applicable? It, RCM is applicable only where uh, pers uh, a registered person buys from an unregistered person. So below 20 lakh, if you are not registered, then you, it, is, it doesn't apply. But below 20 lakh also, if you have taken voluntary registration and you are buying from unregistered person, reverse charge will apply. Otherwise, no. Otherwise, no. no. Thank you. You may be unregistered because you are dealing in exempted goods. So in that situation also, RCM will not apply. Like Ritwik has said, the, you should be registered for applicability of 9.4. Uh, in wise rule says that uh, I have to issue Hello? I have to issue revise once I am allotation gap of sales I will change your mic yes uh, I repeat my question suppose uh, My sale exceeded rupees 20 lakh today. I apply for registration today and I am granted registration after 10 days. After 10 days, I will have to issue revised invoices and I have also to deposit the tax. During these 10 days, I have not collected any tax. So from where I will pay tax to the government? In this case, up I, be, I became liable for registration the day I have crossed 20 lakhs. So the law says that you have to apply for registration within 30 days. So you have applied for registration. Now after 10 days when the registration is granted, it will be effective from the date of application. The date on which you have, because you have applied within 30 days of becoming liable. So now in the meanwhile you can't issue a uh, tax invoice because you are not registered. So when you get registered and the registration is effective from the date of application, that is the date you cross 20 lakhs, then you are allowed to issue bill of uh, the tax invoice. If you are able to recover the tax from your customer, then you can 
increase the value of the supply if he says no no i will not give you then the value itself would be treated as come tax value the valuation rules provide that if you don't recover anything over and above the invoice uh, over and above the amount which is shown there then that value itself will be treated as inclusive of tax please take the mic yeah. first you you can pay out of that tax amount or you can recover from the customer pass on the mic sir this no uh, gst on sale of liquor in the restaurant sir a, lic uh, a restaurant serves liquor uh, say rupees he charges 1000 for the 1000 uh, as price of the liquor and charges rupees 100 as service charge for serving liquor so sir uh, as per vat act the part of service charge is still uh, is a part of consideration uh, consideration for the uh, uh, liquor so would service charge would uh, service charge would apply uh, gst would apply on the service charges or it, it would be tax I'll, under the vat act i'll reply to that anything which is served as part of the restaurant bill will be subject to gst right so restaurant bill itself will have total gst of 18% if it is an air conditioned restaurant or 12% if it is a non air conditioned so whether liquor is served or cold drink is served or food is served on the entire value of food bill which is there in the restaurant including service charge if the restaurant has charged something called service charge again there is a confusion among people so people should not whatever restaurants are putting by way of a service charge that is not a service tax that is something in lieu of tip it is like a compulsory tip that restaurants are putting you know service charge so on that portion also of course on the portion of service charge charged by the restaurant also so the entire total bill of the restaurant on that sgst cgst will apply hmm? deep chika oh. alcohol ki value no sorry suppose i have gone to have dinner so 5 rupees 500 rupees is the food bill 1000 rupees is the alcohol 100 rupees is the service charge now total bill is 1600 rupees so on what i will pay gst that is the issue and at what rate so like revenue secretary sir has just mentioned it it is either 12% or 18% it may be 5% if it is if he is adopting composition so i will not touch about that 5% thing if it is 12 or 18% the gst would be payable on 600 rupees 500 rupees food bill 100 rupees service charges on 1000 rupees you will charge vat because big idea right, yeah, i am sorry yeah vat will be separately charged in the bill on alcohol commodity the goods of alcohol which is consumed on that vat will be charged in the restaurant bill and on the remaining items of food as well as service uh, charges there will be a gst correct yeah good for sir in case of car leasing i took a car lease before july 1 but the lease continues post gst launch now central excise has been paid on this car will i be able to get input credit for that as of now not as of now it will be a problem there are a lot of representations on this about transition for lease uh, service industry we are looking looking at those representation but we are not sure how to handle this are there any other questions I'll ask the last question then, and that is that uh, can the consumer uh, come to know on the bill whether he or she is getting in the bill the benefit of input tax credit? A very good question. In fact, uh, in case of restaurant, earlier whatever was charged uh, by way of service tax, there was no input tax uh, credit available for food items which are served. Now that input tax credit is available, so most of the restaurants would revise their menu. Uh, list you know and the rate of uh, rates which are charged on food item that should be revised downwardly because of the input tax credit which is now available and on top of that they can charge 12% or 18% uh, thing so input tax credit has to be accounted for now in form of reduction in the value of supplies which they are giving thank you uh, mr adia and uh, mr gupta and mr pandey for having joined us that's all the time that we have for you as far as today's masterclass is concerned and we'll be joining you tomorrow live at 4:30 pm again 
The subject tomorrow will be composition and record keeping. And do remember to tweet your questions with hashtag Ask Adya. We will be answered on this subject uh, tomorrow at 4.30 uh, p.m. You are watching us live on uh, Doordarshan Network. We'll be live on Doordarshan Network tomorrow as well. And you can also watch us live on various uh, social media handles of PIB on Facebook, uh, on uh, Twitter, on YouTube as well. And also you can catch the live website, uh, webcast that is tomorrow that is uh, on PIB.NIC.IN. If you still have some questions on this subject, you can log on to www.cbec.gov.in. Thank you so much for watching.